All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our MOS Live program, our Live Animals Snakes Edition. Uh, my name is Becca. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm incredibly excited about this one because snakes are my favorite animal. So I hope that you all enjoy a few of our snakes that we have today. If you're joining us on the Zoom webinar and would like to ask questions at any point, you can click on the, the question button and click uh, or and type in any of your questions. And feel free to also add a name and or age if you would like a shout out if we end up using your question. If you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, we are very excited to see you here today. Uh, but please note that we will not be able to see any of your questions or comments during the live broadcast, but hopefully you enjoy uh, following along as well. And if you're joining us in Zoom and would like to see closed captions, you can click on the closed caption button and click show subtitles. So with that, I think it's time that we get started and meet our first animals. Hello everyone, I'm Liz. I'm the assistant curator of the Live Animal Center. Helping me out today will be Corey, our invertebrate keeper. And I hope you guys are excited to meet some snakes today. Like Becca said, they are definitely my favorite animal too. Now I know a lot of people are a little uncomfortable with snakes. A lot of people are afraid of snakes. So if any of you are, or you're not really sure what you think about, about snakes, I hope at the end of this presentation, uh, you will really enjoy them because they are pretty amazing animals. So with that being said, I'm gonna have Corey turn on the camera and introduce our first snake. So this is a pretty cool little snake, uh, not a huge one. We are starting small. I'll give you that bit of a teaser. Now this is a snake called a Western hognose. Now they do live in the Western and actually central parts of the United States. Now they get that name hognose because they actually do sort of have an upturned snout kind of like a pig. I know she's moving a lot, but actually you just got a really good view of that. Now, while I think that hog nose is very cute, it is actually functional. They will use it to help dig. So they can almost use that hog-like snout as a shovel to kind of dig under the dirt. Now, these are not huge snakes. Uh, she's really not going to get much bigger than this. At full size, they only get about two feet long. You might see a good size one more like three feet in length. So they are definitely a relatively small species of snake. Now, Western hognose snakes have some really interesting defense mechanisms. You might not think of uh, a snake as needing to defend itself because you think they're predators. They don't really have things they, that are going to be coming after them. But many snakes, including small ones like our hognose, are also prey. So other animals might come after this snake. So they have come up with lots of ways to defend themselves. So the first thing a hognose snake is going to do to defend itself, something's coming after it, is hiss. Now, all snakes can hiss. Sometimes people think snakes just go around hissing, constantly making that no noise. That is not true. Only snakes that are upset are going to hiss. Now, even though all snakes hiss, hognose snakes, let's say, just start a little more prone to hissing. They're more readily going to hiss than other snakes. So if that doesn't work, whatever's coming after the hognose is uh, still coming after it, they will then, take the wide scales behind their head, widen them, flatten them, and stick them out. She's not gonna do it because she's not needing to defend herself right now, but it makes them look a little scarier, makes them look maybe like a cobra or something a little more dangerous. So that's the next thing a hog nose will do. If neither of those things work, whatever is coming after the snake is still coming after it, the Western hognose will then play dead. It sounds pretty silly, and I can assure you it looks pretty silly. They will take their bodies, flip over onto their backs, stick their tongue out, and insist they are dead. If whatever's coming after the snake pokes at them, kind of moves them a little bit, tries to flip them back over, the hognose will insist it is dead and keep flipping its body over. 
Uh, a lot of animals aren't as willing to eat dead things as other ones. Uh, so this actually often does work as a defense mechanism. Now, Western hognose, technically they are currently listed as a non-venomous snake species. Um, with that being said, they do have certain properties in their saliva that affects small animals that they eat, kind of paralyzes them. So the saliva almost interacts the way venom does in a lot of cases. Now, the Western hognose is not known to really injure humans, although some humans can get slight irritations um, from the bite of a Western hognose. So scientists aren't quite ready to truly call it a venom, but I guess I'm gonna leave you with stay tuned for Western hognose. Maybe one day scientists, and maybe one day soon, scientists will completely reclassify it and decide that that saliva is enough to be considered a venomous snake. Um, so why don't I turn it over, Becca, see if we have any questions about our hognose. Sure. Uh, and I, I love looking at her. She's definitely one of my favorite snakes at the museum. Uh, and Vivian, age nine, is wondering, uh, what is this animal's name, age, and gender, which I just gave away? <laughs> it is a female. It's often hard to tell males from females uh, from the outside on snakes. Um, these are actually one snake where you can tell uh, females are typically larger than males. So with that being said, you could be looking at a really big male or a really small female, um, but generally females are larger. Now she is about four years old and actually her name was given to her by Becca, the moderator. Uh, her name is Miss Piggy, which is pretty much, I think the most adorable, perfect name uh, for a Western hognose. I think so too, of course, but I thought it was pretty fitting for her. Uh, all right, so we have a question. What kinds of animals would be predators for the Western hognose snake? Probably a lot of birds and pretty much any bigger mammal uh, that's gonna be in that area. Uh, so any wild cat, uh, bobcat, anything like that. Um, definitely things like foxes, um, raccoons, Pretty much anything that might like to eat a small wiggly worm-like thing uh, would go after a Western hognose. Awesome. And what is this hognose's favorite food from Kaylin, age seven? Here at the museum, she eats uh, small mice. Uh, she does eat mice that are already dead. Uh, sometimes people feel a little bit better about that. Uh, in the wild, they actually tend to eat a lot of um, amphibians. Uh, that's one of their favorite things, um, but they will also eat small rodents as well. All right, so uh, one more question before we have to move on to one of our many snakes that we have today um, is what does it take to have this snake so comfortable in Corey's hands? I'm glad people are making that observation because um, a lot of times if you think of it, if you went and picked up a snake in the wild, it's probably not gonna be happy with you and it's not gonna interact like this. We got this snake when she was a little tiny baby. She was only a couple inches long. Uh, she didn't even look like a real animal. And we've been handling her since that point. Uh, so she got very used to being handled by people. Um, so she's pretty comfortable with this. Uh, and she's, uh, she's very happy to just be sitting in uh, Corey's hands right now. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I think it's time I'm going to share my screen for a little bit more information on our Western hognose snake. If you missed uh, anything we said, or if you had more questions that we didn't get the time to go through, you can take a picture of this screen here, and this will give you a good understanding of our Western hognose snake and sort of some of the fun facts about it while we wait for our next snake to be ready. All right, I think we are just about ready with snake number two. All right. Now, our first snake that we met, I told you technically not venomous, although scientists are kind of not sure. The next snake we are going to show you, Corey is not going to be holding in her bare hands, 
This one is a venomous snake. So this is a truly venomous snake. Now this snake you're going to see in just a moment is our timber rattlesnake. You're getting a pretty good view of her right now. Now timber rattlesnakes are native to the eastern parts of the United States. So they are native to New England. A lot of times people are surprised and don't know that we have venomous snakes here in New England. Now timber rattlesnakes are actually a kind of pit viper. Some of you may have heard of vipers before. Actually, you guys are getting an amazing view of her pit right now. So I want you to look at her eye. Now look at her mouth. And now look between her eye and her mouth. That is a pit. So it is a heat detecting pit. Now pit vipers aren't the only snakes that have them, but they have the characteristic just big circular holes. So what these heat detecting pits do, they almost give the snake a sixth sense. They help them detect or pick up on warmth. So this is really helpful for snakes that might be active at nighttime, not able to see as well, and they can pick up on warm animals. So it helps them track prey. Now, I said this was a venomous snake. A lot of times people think most snakes are venomous. It's actually not that many snakes that are truly venomous. There's about 3,000 different snake species, which is a lot. A lot of times people are surprised by that. Of those 3,000 species, about 600 are venomous. So that's a pretty small number. Now, if you take that 600, even less, about a third of that, 200, are considered medically significant or ones that humans would have to worry about. Now, timber rattlesnakes are considered a medically significant snake, definitely. Now, kind of the last fun thing I wanted to share about our rattlesnake is the whole rattle. Now, she's kind of sitting curled up. I don't know that you have a great view of her rattle right now, but sometimes people are kind of confused about it. So the rattle is at the end of the snake's tail, and it's actually just made of pieces of loosely attached keratin. Now keratin is a protein. It's actually the same material that makes up snake scales. So their, their rattle is made of the same thing as their scales. Keratin is also the same material that makes up our fingernails and our hair. So those pieces of keratin, every time the snake sheds, it adds a new segment of that keratin. And then when they shake or vibrate their tail, those pieces kind of rub together and create almost a buzzing rattle sound. Uh, now I actually have an example of a shed rattle from our rattlesnake. So you might think since they add a segment each time they shed, does the rattle just grow forever? And it does get to a point where it gets too long that it probably gets stuck on things. So they will shed the entire rattle. I don't know if you guys can hear it over the, over the um, audio, um, but I am rattling it right now. Um, so then they will start the regrowing process uh, once they do shed that rattle. Um, but I always think that's kind of cool. Uh, and if you live in an area where you have a lot of venomous snakes, uh, like Corey does, uh, she's actually from the western parts of the United States. She has found rattles before uh, when she's been out on hikes, which I think is so cool. Now I mentioned timber rattlesnakes are native to New England. They're actually not common, uh, especially in Massachusetts. They're actually considered endangered in the state. Pretty much the only area you can find them is the Blue Hills. Uh, which are kind of south of Boston. Now, I'm sure lots of questions have come up about her, Becca, so why don't I turn it over to some of those? Sure, uh, and you kind of partially answered Karen's question about uh, should Karen be worried about timber, ra timber rattlesnakes when out hiking here in New England? You really don't have to be worried. Um, they, like I said, they're pretty much very restricted to the Blue Hills area uh, in Massachusetts. And even if you do encounter a venomous snake, because again, if you're like Corey and you're from more Western parts of the US, you might encounter venomous snakes if you like to spend a lot of time outdoors. 
really, as long as you leave them alone, they're not going to be any more aggressive than any other animal, any other snake. So just give them their distance, stay back. They're going to know that you're not good prey for them. Because uh, if you look at our rattlesnake, she's pretty awesome, but she's a relatively small snake. She would never be able to eat a human. So she wouldn't want to bite and kind of use her venom on something that wouldn't be a good meal for her. So you generally want to appreciate snakes from a distance. Uh, I know it might be scary if you think you see a venomous one, um, but as long as you leave them alone, they're more than happy to leave you alone. Awesome. And now we have quite a few people, including Prisha, age eight, and Vivian, age nine, and Karen asking, what is the name, age, and gender of the animal? Um, we actually didn't uh, name this particular snake. So maybe you guys could uh, type in some good suggestions for her. Um, I'm not sure why she ends up not getting a name. Um, she should have one, even though she's venomous. Um, she is about uh, five years old. And I keep saying she, we were told when we got her from another zoo that it was a female, um, but I actually don't know for sure. Typically you have to go inside a snake to know for sure. Um, so we just kind of took their word for it, but we have not done that procedure uh, to tell for sure if it is a female. Awesome. I will also think of some names. <laughs> um, and then one last question before we have to move on to our next snake uh, is a really good question that people could hear the rattle, which is awesome, but do all rattles uh, sound the same or does it change based on the species of snake? That's a good question. The only rattle I've heard in person is the timber rattlesnake because it's the only species of venomous snake I've ever taken care of. Um, my guess, my educated guess, is that rattles might sound a little bit different because um, some might be a little bit bigger, different species. Uh, what's really neat too is a lot of snakes that do not have a rattle, are not venomous, vibrate their tail anyway to kind of imitate the sound of a rattle. And that definitely sounds different than this, um, but it is pretty cool. So yes, I guess I will have to leave you with just an educated guess for that one. Awesome, thank you. And once again, I'm going to share my screen as we head to our next uh, snake. And this is some more interesting information. I know there were a few questions we couldn't get to, so I apologize for that, but hopefully some of these answers uh, definitely do answer some of those questions. So hopefully you can take a picture of this screen and you'll learn a little bit more about our timber, timber rattlesnake. That is a tongue twister as we wait for our next snake. I think we are ready for our next snake. All right. Awesome. So our next snake is our rainbow boa. So this snake is a little bit different than our rattlesnake that we just saw uh, for the main reason that she is not venomous. So uh, rainbow boas can be found in South America and they like tropical rainforests. So rainbow boas get their name because it's a little hard to see right now, but when the light hits their scales, it actually makes a rainbow color on them. And you might think when you see it that this snake actually has rainbow on them, but it's actually a trick they use. Light comes in and hits their scale, which is formed differently than other scales. The light comes in, hits those scales, bounces off, and gives a rainbow shine. Now, what makes that really cool is not only is the top part of their scale have those dimensions to give that rainbow shine, but underneath it are pigmented scales. So that's why you can see her, I would call it almost like a red brown, um, brown and black coloring on her body. So super cool. So these snakes live to be about 15 to 20 years and in captivity can live even a little bit longer. Um, Rainbow boas are carnivores like all snakes. They are ambush predators. So they actually sit and wait for their prey to come by and they'll shoot out, grab their prey, and then constrict or wrap their body around their prey until it's no longer alive and then they eat it. 
So a little bit different than our rattlesnake who uses its venom to um, subdue its prey. So rainbow boas, uh, they actually used to be a threatened species. Um, I'd actually have to double check their conservation status as of recent, but local communities actually really value this snake because their main diet is mice and rats. And that helps clean up around these villages so they're not overwhelmed with, um, with rodents. So they're actually really important. But this animal, because it is so beautiful, and it is a little tough right now to see that rainbow color, because she's so beautiful, this species has been taken out of the wild a lot for the pet trade. So as we talked about before on our program, it's really important to do all of your research before you purchase an animal. Um, I'm just gonna jump in and see if anyone has questions about our awesome rainbow boa. Sure, we do have a lot of questions already. Uh, and the pretty standard questions, what is the name, age, and gender of our rainbow boa here? Yes, so this is Iris. Iris is a, uh, four years old and she will be turning five this year. Uh, she's actually lived at the museum almost her whole life. So when she came in, she was just really, really tiny. Um, Liz would have to confirm the exact size, but I'm pretty sure she was around like a foot. She was really just a little girl. Um, now she is currently almost probably around five feet. And uh, rainbow boas on average are four to six feet with the females being a little bit bigger up to that six feet. So she probably has another foot that she could grow, which is pretty cool. Um, I think I hit all of the name, the age and gender. I think you did, thank you. Uh, TJH11 is wondering what type of animals would eat a rainbow boa? Great question. So pretty much anything that can get its hands on it, any large carnivore, so um, any large carnivore mammal, birds, other reptiles, they would go after a rainbow boa. Um, and vice versa, a rainbow boa would go after small mammals, they'd go after smaller rodents, smaller amphibians, and smaller reptiles as well. These guys are uh, nocturnal or crepuscular, so they spend their, their awake time during the night or during dawn and dusk. And that's when they do a lot of their hunting, but they will come out to bathe in that beautiful sunlight if they're starting to feel a little cold. All right, and I think our last question on our rainbow boa before we move on to our last snake, since we still have one more, uh, is do uh, kind of a couple of questions. Do these spots represent something or what evolutionary benefit does the snake get from being rainbow-like? So a little bit about its color. That's a fantastic question. Uh, so rainbow boas, they are, they pretty much hang out on the ground, so they're terrestrial. And so their coloring helps them blend in with the forest floor, fallen leaves, bark that's fallen, so they can blend in really well. The other reason for that rainbow is that rainbow is not something that we naturally see in the wild all the time, especially on the forest floor. So if a predator all of a sudden sees a rainbow color move through the forest floor, they are going to be really startled. So it's going to it's going to make that predator at least hesitate for at least a, a second, which gives the rainbow boa time to get away. This is actually um, an adaptation that lots of animals use. Uh, are the big butterfly, the common morphos? They use the same technique. That blue that they flash is very startling because, as our other show uh, talked about. Blue is not a naturally occurring color. It's very rare to have something that's a true blue pigment. All right, well, I think it is just about time to switch to our uh, last animal. So once again, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get some more facts about our Brazilian rainbow boa. So I know there were a few unanswered questions. Hopefully this helps answer a few of them. And you can also see a good picture of seeing that rainbow pattern kind of in action uh, as we get ready for our very last animal. And we are actually ready to go with our last one because it's awesome. probably one of the coolest ones. I agree. <laughs> so this is our common boa. So our common boa is an incredibly large snake. And while, he, and while he looks really large, he's actually not the largest. These can also be found in South America. So you might 
kind of be able to see a little bit, Liz actually has the boa wrapped around her waist. So uh, our boa here has actually been trained to hang on to Liz's weight, waist because he is such a big snake. He weighs about 14 pounds and is about, um, I believe it was like nine to 10 feet in length. So it's pretty big. Not the biggest snake or the heaviest snake, but still really big. Just like our rainbow boa, um, our common boa here is a constrictor. So same thing, they can wrap around uh, their prey and then eat their prey. So you might be a little worried about Liz here, but don't worry. Uh, one, this uh, common boa has been trained and knows Liz, they've worked together a lot. And two, Liz is way too big for this snake to eat. So a lot of snakes, as Liz mentioned before, will measure their prey up and that will determine what they eat or not. So being in captivity and being handled so often as an ambassador animal, and the fact that Liz is so much larger than he is, those things keep her nice and safe. Because we only have a few minutes left, I wanna jump right into questions and see what people wanna know. Sure thing, and I love staring at this animal, so I'm excited. Um, so we have sort of two similar questions. Kaylin, age seven, is wondering what does it eat, but also TJ, age 11, is wondering what might eat it. Those are fantastic questions. So uh, our common boa is also an ambush predator. So they will sit and wait for their prey to come in front of them. They'll eat mammals. Birds are their main source of diet. Uh, rodents and, and birds are kind of the main source, but they'll kind of eat anything that is size-wise appropriate for them. Amphibians, reptiles as well. Um, they will go for all of those. And as what a great question of what will eat them because yes, other animals will eat them. There aren't exact predators picked out for the common boa of like this specific animal really preys on the common boa, um, but really anything that can, again, get its hands on the common boa will. They'll take advantage if the animal is sick, if it's cold because they're ectotherm, they need that heat to be able to move. So if it's really cold, if it's really cold, then the common boa can't move. So ocelots are, can be prey. That's a type of, um, it's a, fe a feline larger mammal will eat the common boa, but it also can be eaten by the common boa. So pretty crazy. Awesome. And uh, Prisha, age eight, is wondering uh, name, age, and gender. And also Aria, age five, is wondering how long can this snake grow? Yes, great question. So uh, this is Belize. And Belize is about 15 years old. Um, and for lengthwise, Belize is pretty much full grown. The average, the average length, it kind of varies depending on what source you're looking at, but can be anywhere from eight feet to 13 feet. 13 feet would be like maximum. So that'd be a pretty big common boa, but not the largest snake out in the world. All right. And Emily, age eight, is wondering, can they bite? I mean, I know a lot of people are a little concerned about Liz, although you did say that Liz is safe. <laughs> Liz is very safe. So yes, at the museum, we say anything with a mouth can bite. But again, Liz has been working with this animal for so long that Belize is very comfortable with her. Um, again, he's a program animal and gets handled by lots of different people. This is his job, you know. Um, so it, it could happen, um, but Liz also knows how to work with them. She's moving in a way that she knows Belize isn't gonna be startled and isn't gonna feel threatened because Belize isn't gonna bite Liz unless she feels really threatened, which is with a lot of animals. So like Liz said, in the wild, uh, common boas would not react the same way as Liz is holding her now. So again, appreciating from afar is always the best thing to do. Awesome. And we are just about out of time, but I do want to ask this last question because it kind of relates to every single one of the snakes and it's something a lot of people don't think of. Uh, Zachary, age eight, is wondering, does it drink water or do they only drink the liquid out of other animals? That's a great question. Um, Becca, do you actually, you are our resident snake expert. Do you want to answer this one? <laughs> sure. Uh, they do, in fact, drink water. Uh, all of our snakes have little water bowls and it's kind of fun to see them drinking. It's one of my favorite things to see because I think it's absolutely adorable. But I think actually in our last picture, you'll be able to see one of them. Yes. And because and to piggyback off of that, our snakes also as enrichment get baths. So uh, they'll be put into basins full of water because 
a lot of snakes also are really good swimmers. So common boas like Belize here do swim and they're good swimmers. They just don't do it a lot compared to like an anaconda that spends a lot of its time in water. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Corey. And thank you, Liz, for all your awesome information. I think it's time that I will uh, share on my screen one more time so that you get any more information about our common or Central American boa constrictor. I see you can't actually see his water bowl in this, but I believe we saw it in the rattlesnake picture. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Again, feel free to take a picture of this screen. And if you wanted to learn any more facts about our Central American boa constrictor, um, and the one that we have at the museum is Belize. So I think I'm going to move on to my next slide here. Awesome, I want to uh, thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we do not have a live animal program next week as some of the MOS live programs will be on hiatus, but definitely check out our uh, museum social media and also our uh, museum uh, website for any additional information in the future. And if you would like to support the museum, you can go to engage.mos.org slash welcome. So again, I apologize that there were some unanswered questions. There were quite a few, uh, but thank you all very much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.